we call it an elaborate website. It's intended to be uh, the one-stop shopping for ORM and related information, and it has uh, all the things that a person would expect to see on an ORM website. There are training materials on there, there are points of contact and links to risk management sites and such. ORM uh, applies to essentially everything that we do. When it comes to force protection, you wouldn't walk into town in uniform. But some of us wear something just as blatantly American. You've seen them, slogan t-shirts and unit hats. Leave your sense of humor and your unit pride on base. Blend in with the Europeans. Don't stick out. And oh, go downtown with a friend. It's safer and a lot more fun. Want to make a few improvements to your home or workplace? Your self-help program can get you started. Whether it's a new look, a few improvements, or just a minor repair, you and your family can get tools, supplies, and expert advice on dozens of do-it-yourself projects. Check out everything that's available through the self-help program and see how easy it is to make your corner of the world a better place. No one expects to get into legal trouble when they're stationed overseas. But if you do, you should know about the SOFA. A SOFA, or Status of Forces Agreement, is an agreement between the U.S. and host countries that's designed to help protect and define the legal rights of American military members overseas. Just like an insurance policy, it's important to know what kind of coverage you have. If you need clarification about the SOFA, contact your legal assistance office. September 15, 1966, near Tui Hoa, Republic of Vietnam. An infantry unit from the 101st Airborne Division is pinned down and under savage attack by a powerful Viet Cong force. Company A, led by platoon leader First Lieutenant Leslie Kennedy, comes to their aid. Kennedy's platoon is met with heavy enemy resistance. As a machine gun unloads a relentless barrage on his men, he begins crawling toward its position. He's fired upon from two directions. Completely disregarding his own safety, Kennedy stands up in the hail of bullets and rushes one weapon and then another, knocking them out with rifle and grenade fire. Kennedy's courage inspires his men to charge the enemy, forcing a retreat. A fearless leader, an extraordinary hero. Army First Lieutenant Leslie D. Kennedy, recognized in America's gallery of heroes. Hey, everybody, what? In September of 1781, the sleepy village of Yorktown was the scene of events that led to victory in America's fight for independence. The British Army, led by Lord Cornwallis, had invaded Virginia and occupied the port of Yorktown. Cornwallis's main concern was French General Lafayette to the south. Meanwhile, from the north, General Washington was planning an attack that would trap Cornwallis on land. Washington called all the militia he could muster to his camp in Peekskill, New York. French General Rochambeau joined Washington, increasing the Army's strength. A fleet of French warships en route to the Chesapeake would further prevent a sea escape. When Allied guns opened on Yorktown, the defenders were stunned by a lethal attack. Cornwallis attempted to escape across the York River. With no hope of rescue, he was forced to surrender. Isolating enemy forces, part of a successful strategy employed by America's fighting forces at Yorktown. Welcome to your late edition news. I'm Staff Sergeant Ryan Hope. Our top story tonight, AFN News is replacing its 20 and 10 minute weekday TV newscasts with shorter news breaks airing throughout the day. Starting on Monday, variety segments will air inside other entertainment and news programs and will be targeted to the interests of that show's audience. AFN's new Newsline will feature four and five minute blocks of military and Europe related news at four consistent times throughout the day, with your weather forecast airing three times a day instead of two. Of course, your exchange rates won't go away. Your first rate update will be at 5.05 p.m. Central European time, followed by more updates later in the evening. 
For more information about the upcoming change, you can log on to our website at afneurope.army.mil. In other news tonight, 12th Aviation Brigade soldiers out of Giebelstadt, Germany, have swooped into Tunisia, Africa for a live fire exercise straight out of the movies. During the exercise, helicopters air assaulted three teams into the area. Two teams had the job of laying suppressive cover fire for the third team, the primary assault force. The 12th Aviation soldiers had to move quickly during the exercise, performing 12 airdrops in a matter of about 30 seconds. 12th Aviation Brigade leaders say it was a great opportunity for pilots and crew chiefs to practice air assault training under realistic conditions. Well, most Air Force people have also played a part in exercises simulating wartime conditions and making what most times is a base-wide training event as realistic as possible falls on the shoulders of the Base Capabilities Assessment Team, or BCAT. Air Force Sergeant Dorlinda Barker followed members of the 100th Air Refueling Wing BCAT team at RAF Milden Hall in England and brings us a first-hand look at the team in action. Tag along with me. I get it. I'm Master Sergeant Billy Fenner is a Base Capabilities Assessment Team, or BCAT, member. During exercises, he's checking everything, from the seal on a gas mask to the zippers on a chem suit. So that's not. You're dead. You don't have a seal on your mask. This inch right here wasn't zipped all the way, so the toxins seeped up my big boots and slipped in and, and did the trick and took me out. My job is to design a scenario that is challenging but realistic to the AGS personnel so that we can function and fight in real wartime conditions. Common sense drives how a base-wide exercise goes. Uh, would it normally happen in real world conditions? And we get with other personnel on the base, other BCAT members, and we try to get the whole base to, to come together and build a scenario that's realistic for the entire base. BCAT members are subject matter experts, must know their unit's mission, and be able to document any discrepancies. The appropriate response for this patrolman was to get the individual out of the area, conduct a sweep of the resource, make sure no devices were left behind, and then to apprehend the subject and conduct a search. It's nothing better than seeing a slide come up when we go through the hot wash and saying, look, these people have really done the job right by name, by rank, by organization, and everybody sees it. Evaluators are there every step of the way to ensure airmen know what to do before, during, and after an attack. The closer we get to the end, the tighter we get with the requirements. So by the end of the end of the exercise, as we've seen today, the skills are really sharp and personnel are on top of what they're doing. After the exercise, BCAP members discuss what went right, what went wrong, and how to fix those problems in the future. As Master Sergeant Benner says, it's a never-ending process to perfection. Staff Sergeant Dorlinda Barker, Air Force News, RAF Mildenhall, the United Kingdom. Coming up in just a minute, your local station will have your late edition newscast. But first, let's take a look at your U.S. dollar exchange rates. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The European Union's idea for a rapid reaction force has stirred up a lot of controversy lately, especially from Britain and Germany, who both continue to stress the importance of NATO in the region. U.S. Secretary of Defense William Cohen has also joined in urging the, e the EU to include NATO in its development of the force. As tonight's European Journal reports, many EU officials simply see the plan as part Who made the first transatlantic flight? It wasn't Lindbergh. The flight left New York on May 8, 1919. Four aircraft were involved, but only one did the entire trip. The first transatlantic flight was made by naval aviators. They flew a Navy Curtis flying boat and made several stops, taking a total of 23 days. And that's another little known fact of military history. If you're a service member's spouse, the employment specialist at the Family Center can help match your skills with training and job opportunities. So, Mrs. Davis, you list several job skills. Well, I like working with computers. Ah, oh, well, good. We can... I'm also good with tools. That's, I see. And I'm musically inclined. Uh, Mrs. Davis, perhaps your computer skills are a good place to start. That's... Contact the Family Center. Discover how your talents can pay off. Auto racing got its start in America in 1895, when the first organized auto race took place along the shore of Lake Michigan. Over a distance of 52 miles, the cars averaged a lightning speed of 6 miles per hour. As the years passed, races were held across the country. Though some featured specially built cars, others were held with American-made cars that were stock, meaning right off the lot. During Prohibition, these souped-up stock cars were often used to run liquor and earned the nickname bootleg cars. The first organized stock car race was held with modified American streetcars at Daytona Beach, Florida in 1936. While the early races were run on regular roads, the threat of injury to spectators eventually moved the racing events to specially built tracks. Stock car racing is the only type of auto racing limited to American-made cars and has become one of the largest spectator sports in the country. We now... Americans from all over the country are pretty patriotic, and we've proven it by the names of our towns. We've named many of our cities after our heroes. George Washington is the most popular. There's a town named Washington in 26 different states, not to mention the capital city of the United States. Abraham Lincoln makes a good showing, with 22 states naming towns after him. Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, is also popular. 20 states have towns named Jefferson. We also name our towns for our ideals, the things we count most important as Americans. There are 16 states that remember our heritage with towns called Liberty, and 12 states that celebrate independence. There's even a Constitution, Georgia, and a Freedom, Pennsylvania. Freedom's remembered in eight other states as well. All across the country, Americans have reaffirmed their patriotism through the names of our towns and cities. March 9, 1966. A small U.S. Special Forces camp in the Aschau Valley was under attack by 2,000 North Vietnamese. An AC-47 gunship with First Lieutenant Delbert Peterson as co-pilot was dispatched to provide support. They were met by low cloud cover, mountainous terrain, and a steady rain of enemy fire. The bullet-ridden gunship was forced to crash land on a mountain slope. Rather than leave an injured gunner behind, the crew set up a defense at the site. In the ground fighting that followed, the captain and another crew member were killed. Peterson, now in command, realized that unless he moved quickly, an approaching rescue helicopter would be downed by an enemy machine gun only yards away. Spraying bullets from his M16, he courageously charged the machine gun as the helicopter dropped to pick up the other crew members. Peterson's fate is presumed killed in action. Air Force First Lieutenant Delbert Peterson, remembered in America's gallery of heroes. As the American frontier pushed westward, it was the duty of the U.S. Army to defend our changing borders. The logistical challenges of this mission were staggering. To support small detachments scattered over thousands of miles, the Army had to maintain widely separated posts on the frontier. Is the supply wagon here yet? Not yet. At Fort Laramie, for instance, the nearest supply depot was at Cheyenne, almost 90 miles away. 
The distance and the ruggedness of the journey made it advisable to keep six months' supplies on hand. Supplies were obtained by contract in the east and shipped by rail, riverboat, and wagon train to the post nearest the troops. Supplies, sir! But sometimes supplies went astray and took Open months box, or even years to Tell arrive. Tell the cook we eat tonight. Well, I'll be dang. Military logistics has come a long way since then. Flashback TV presents the show that was nominated for Best Director, Alfred Hitchcock. That was beautifully put. Best Male Personality, Alfred Hitchcock. Excuse me, I need a moment to pull myself together. Best Series, Alfred Hitchcock presents. But I'm Alfred Hitchcock. I am. I can prove it. Yes, when it comes to really good TV, you'll find it here. Flashback TV's Alfred Hitchcock presents. After hearing that, there's nothing more I wish to add. Some things are worth repeating.